I've been lied to and and cheated on and uh, ghosted. In Slovakia, it's different. It's more traditional. You know, you go on dates, you show interest, you kiss. And once you kiss, you're together. Suddenly I felt like, what for? Is all of this good if I have nobody to share it with? So I literally started thinking about leaving the U.S. and leaving my dream behind. Hello and welcome to another Dating Beyond Borders podcast. Today we have another story of moving countries. This time we'll talk about moving from Europe to the U.S., namely from a country that is not so well known, Slovakia. And to help me dive into that is Tatiana, who runs Landing America podcast, where she explores very similar topics. We will talk about the highs and lows of switching countries, compare the dating scenes, and explore the cultural differences between the two. So welcome, Tatiana. Thank you so much, Marina. It's a pleasure. Thank you for coming on. So can you tell me or can you tell everybody that's listening or watching this, where are you currently living? I live in Miami, Florida right now. And how long have you been in Miami for? I've been here for six years since 2018. Okay. So when you tell people in the U.S. that you're from Slovakia, do people actually even know the country or are they like Sweden, Slovenia? Do they get it confused? They are very confused. Um, they ask me, oh, you mean Czechoslovakia? And I'm like, well, over 30 years ago it was, but now it's a separate country. Um, then a lot of people confuse Slovakia with Slovenia. That's like the second popular. <laughs> and then um, I've heard things like, oh, Slovakia is in Ukraine. And then also Slovakia. Oh, I've heard that's in England. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that was very bizarre. Yeah, it, it was funny. But not many people know, actually. they I usually have to explain like where in Europe it is. That reminds me of a conversation I had with a hairdresser. She was like, um, you know, I'm from Italy, but um, I, you know, I was I was uh, I was born there and then I moved to Canada when I was one years old. And, you know, there is an island close to Italy, but I can't remember the name. Hmm. Is it Siberia? <laughs> and I go, I think it's Malta, but close. <laughs> and you know what? Maybe she also meant Sardinia because that sounds similar. And it's an island next to Italy, too. What have you found that wasn't so glamorous upon coming to Miami? I've experienced a lot of disappointment that was based on me not knowing what I'm going into, especially the dating scene here really sucks, <laughs> honestly. Um, I know it from my own experience. I know it from experience of all my friends. Um, I don't want to offend anybody, obviously, but um, it's it's very different. I don't know if it's because it's very touristy. So, you know, people come and go. So nobody really takes anything that seriously. Even when I lived in Malta, I had bad experiences because of that. And I was telling myself, I'm never going to live again in a place that's so touristy because, you know, tourists come to have fun and then locals are waiting for tourists. <laughs> To have fun with them so <laughs> nobody's totally serious and um yeah i came across a lot of you know ghosting you know people i mean guys because i was not dating girls but guys um they show interest and uh, the next day or a few days later they they just disappear uh which was something new I feel like in Slovakia or Europe in general, people are more authentic and straightforward and open. And if they show interest, it means they really have the interest. And if they don't have the interest, they will tell you that, sorry, it's, this is not working out. Here, it's very, I don't know, uh, there is a lot of options. And the mentality is that, oh, you cannot give me that. There will be someone else that's going to give me that. You know, it's so many people here. Um, so, yeah, 
I've been disappointed many times because, you know, I've been lied to and, and cheated on and uh, ghosted and people are flaky. Um, they, you know, agree on a date with you and they then they don't follow up. So on the on that day when the date is supposed to come, you're wondering like, is this happening or is it not happening or what's going on? <laughs> um, they also cancel you last minute. So eventually I ended up making always a plan B because, you know, girls take a lot of time to get ready and you spend two hours getting ready and uh, the guy cancels on you uh, the last minute. So eventually I always had a plan B to not waste the preparation. <laughs> But it's very, it's really sad. I mean, right now I'm laughing at it, but uh, whoever is going through that right now here in Miami, I, I sympathize with them because it was really tough. Yeah, it's interesting listening to you because Miami has this characteristic of being the bigger, better deal kind of city, whereas I'm going to look for the best of the best of the best. And I've heard this, what you've told me, I've heard it from a man's point. I mean, I met this guy when I was in Mexico and he was, I think a typical Miami guy. I'm not sure if, if that's the thing, but he was like, he was an older man and he obviously had a lot of money and he was used to spending that money on women. And he told us uh, that in Miami, women really expect a lot. Like if they're going to get invited somewhere, they're going to have two, three options of yacht parties and like uh, a, a cool dinner party or, and everything is paid for, for them. And so in order to get a woman out on a date, you really have to over deliver in terms of how much you're going to spend on her. So it feels a little bit transactional to me. And actually, I don't want to say a little bit. I feel like it's very transactional. Uh, if we talk about the U.S. and even the world, Miami is definitely considered the, that transactional kind of uh, city. Yeah, uh, for sure. I know that, like I said, I was not dating women, but I know from the guys who told me how the women here are. So I'm not blaming them, you know, it's it's basically reciprocal, you know, you get disappointed and then it's it continues, you know, like you get disappointed and then you disappoint <laughs> other people uh, in a sense. Um, I know that this is a very expensive city, not Everyone can afford to live here unless you have a decent job or decent income. And uh, for sure, it's uh, it's expensive to take a girl on a date. And I understand that a lot of guys prefer to maybe take a girl on a walk for the first date or just a simple coffee because to take her for a dinner and spend $500 on a dinner and she then ghosts you that's not very nice i i feel their pain obviously maybe the girl was just hungry that day you know maybe she wasn't just even interested and she just wanted to have a free meal so i feel bad for both genders you know it's not just i was hurt i i understand their point of view and unfortunately I believe uh, a lot of people come here um, with an idea for a better life. And a lot of women consider men to be the one who will give them better life. <laughs> so they have very high expectations. And I've noticed uh, with some men that when they encounter somebody who's either not from here or who hasn't lived here for too long that would be influenced with this culture, like I am myself, uh, they really do appreciate uh, this different approach that the girl doesn't really want to just use them for money or for a free meal. Uh, but there is an actual interest Listening to you, you raised a great point, where, which is that um, someone hurts you, so you become m kind of bitter and you take it out on someone else. So it's it keeps going and going and going. So uh, 
And I see this with other cities and I mean, just the world in general, that we're much more or less vulnerable now because someone did something to us. So we're not so open or we're bitter. and We go into that ne- next date with that sort of energy. Uh, and it is very interesting. I definitely have more stories to share with you as well about Miami that are super funny and just that's so Miami. But I really want to ask you about how did you and your boyfriend meet? Because you said it was such a difficult dating scene, uh, but you guys are now dating and you're living together, right? That's correct. Mm-hmm. So what happened? How did you guys, how did you guys make it happen in Miami? <laughs> um, I feel like it's a miracle. <laughs> To be honest, <laughs> yeah, uh, we met at um, a stand-up comedy, so it was very organic. Uh, my friend, she was doing a stand-up uh, comedy shows, and also one of his uh, best friends is a stand-up comedian. So I went with her to uh, support her, you know, fellow comedians, and he also went to the show to see his friend. And it's a kind of a funny story because he saw me when I entered. I didn't see him because it was a big crowd. And after a while, like I was sitting next to the bar. He was uh, walking towards the bar and he uh, he was looking at me and I saw him and he smiled at me. So I smiled back at him and then I needed to go use the restroom. So I left to the restroom but the restroom had the code and I didn't know what the code is to get inside. So I went to the bar to ask the bartender what the code is. But when I stood next to him, he just asked me, hey, what would you like to drink? Which was very nice because I feel like guys don't ask it here very often, especially because, you know, girls, they get drinks for free every time with promoters. Drinks are $30, you know, it's expensive. So it was impressive <laughs> that he asked that. And I said, oh, I just need the code to the restroom. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, and he was like, oh, it's four zeros. I'm like, thank you. But at the same time, I felt bad to just leave because he was nice. So I said, but if you want to know what uh, I want to drink, you can ask the bartender. He knows what I'm drinking. And I left. So I left it kind of open for him. And I went to the restroom and then I came back and he was not there. And the drink was not there. <laughs> and, I was, <laughs> and I was looking around like, what's going on? And he was sitting far away and he pointed to the bartender. So I went to the bartender and the bartender tells me, so what are you drinking? I have no idea. <laughs> so the bartender didn't remember so I told him what was my drink and then he gave me the drink and then my boyfriend he just like cheered me from far away he said like hi cheers so that was really nice because many times when I was going out the guys obviously when they buy you a drink they want to talk to you right away hey where are you from what are you doing do you have a boyfriend and they're on top of you right and you know, that's sometimes it's not ideal. <laughs> um, so I really appreciated the gesture without expecting anything from me. And then maybe an hour later, when my friend, she went to the restroom and I was alone, he stopped by and he just said hello. And we were talking for a little bit. He exchanged numbers and then we started meeting. So, but one important thing that I wanted to say about this is that uh, I've been through, you know, some breakups, some disappointments, and after a while living here, I felt that I live in a paradise. Miami is beautiful. The nature and the sun and the weather and everything, it's my dream come true. And I uh, loved my job. I was making good money. I had good friends. I lived nicely. Everything was perfect. The only thing that was not good was that it was impossible to find a soulmate. It was impossible to find love. And I started giving up. I started giving up. And especially I traveled to Europe. I spent three weeks in Europe. And I felt 
different energy and different people, different culture. And suddenly I started missing Europe. I started missing people, the, the genuine interaction, the genuine interest that men have there. And suddenly I felt like, what for? Is all of this good if I have nobody to share it with? So I literally started thinking about leaving the U.S. and leaving my dream behind and 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 moving somewhere else because because of this reason that I couldn't find love. So, and that was exactly around the time, like maybe a week after that I actually met my boyfriend. What a crazy coincidence. I, I love that you're so genuine about it because I think that there is no one perfect place, right? Because you can have it all. You can have a perfect beach. You can have the sun. You can have amazing weather, which I love, by the way. I also love that weather and I love Miami for that reason. And I never spend the winters in a cold place. I always go to Mexico or somewhere else. But I know the feeling of being alone, in Mexico. I know the feeling of looking at palm trees and not feeling anything because you can't share it with anybody. And I think a lot of us have bought into a life that is just driven by picking the perfect place, you know, and just enjoying that. And it may look good on Instagram or TikTok, but when you're alone in that place, like no amount of palm trees is going to make you feel like you belong because you're just alone, right? And so then you go to Europe and you're like, maybe it's not so bad if it's a little bit cold or maybe it's not so bad because then I can share it with someone. And so that's, that is so interesting to hear you say that because I can totally relate. And I think so many people can relate to that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, I believe in signs and there has been multiple signs that made me believe that this is the place where I belong and where I should be. Because if I haven't met him, I would probably leave. But again, I received the sign that I should be here. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is I- ironic because we often just move around so much because we're expecting things to happen immediately. Like we'll spend a few years somewhere and you feel like, okay, well, I can't find love here. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the next place. But then the next place doesn't offer you that either. So essentially, you keep running around because you don't feel grounded anywhere, which is why this the amount of choice that we have is so crippling because you're like, where am I going to be happy? Where can I be happy? Right. But I think it all really comes down to or a lot of it comes down to having someone in your life that makes you feel grounded, because when you're with someone, then you feel like, OK, I can actually build roots in this place versus just running around looking for the next best thing. And so I think it's, it's kind of, if you believe in the universe showing you something, then um, I think that was kind of a sign for you to stay in Miami. 100% people need somebody to, to lean on, to rely on, to be their rock. And there is this mentality here, you know, in Miami that oh there is nothing somebody can do for me that I cannot do for myself but I don't believe I don't believe that it's um you know they're just saying that because they didn't meet the right person yeah I I think it's up to a point in life like in our 20s and our 30s we're like yeah we can do it we don't need anybody we don't need a man but when you're in your 50s or 60s and you're alone on the beach somewhere, it's not going to be that glamorous. You know, you have nobody to go home with. You have nobody to tell, you know, to share this experience with. I remember I was in Mexico and I met this man who was very wealthy and he was renting this villa on the beach. And the reason I met him is because we were um, we basically met a guy who was staying at his house. The guy didn't know him. The guy was walking on the beach. And this millionaire offered him to spend the night at his place. And this guy, this guy invited us over for a party. And I met this millionaire and he was the loneliest man I've ever met. And that was why he had offered a random stranger to spend, I think it was three days at his place for free because he just needed company so bad. And you could see it like he just invited the most random people to his place because he didn't want to be there alone. 
Yeah, whatever you achieve in life, you need somebody to share it with. And especially if you're an immigrant and if you live far away from your family, it's, yeah. it's essential. So let's talk about Slovakia first. What is the dating scene like in Slovakia? What are Slovakian men like? Slovak men like? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been 10 years since I've been dating in, uh, in Slovakia. Um, I've been dating a Slovak guy in Malta. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very different from guys here. Yeah, I think men in Slovakia, you know, when they're interested, they show the interest. They are not afraid to show the interest. I don't think they are showing interest at 10 uh, different locations. They are just interested in you and they, are go, they, they go for it. And, but the dating scene is different, or at least what I remember, I went on a date, two dates, three dates. And then if you go on three dates, that means that both parties like each other. So they would usually try to kiss you, <laughs> you know, um, here it was different because the guys usually try to kiss you after the first date when you usually just don't know yet if it's there or not because you know he might be attractive but then the date was not interesting you didn't like his personality so you don't feel like kissing him even if he's the hottest dude or he might not be as extremely good looking but then you've been vibing but even then you know it was just first date you don't feel like kissing him and the culture here is it's like that. They all just try to kiss you after the first date. But imagine if you go on 100 dates, <laughs> you're going to kiss 100 guys. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's been weird, you know. And uh, I even had an experience that like we just got into an Uber to go on a date and he already tried to kiss me. So it's just like, you know, I cannot wrap my head around that. But in Slovakia, it's different. It's more traditional, you know, you go on dates, you show interest, you kiss. And once you kiss, you're together, you're dating, you're a boyfriend, a girlfriend. You don't necessarily have to say it. It's a fact. You go meet friends, you go together somewhere, you hold hands. Here, it's not the same. Because, for example, when I started dating my boyfriend, uh, one month after that, he asked me if I would like to be his girlfriend, which was super romantic and my heart melted. I almost felt like he's proposing to me, like, because it never happened to me before that somebody would like officially ask me to be his girlfriend. But I'm like, hell yeah, I thought we were boyfriend and girlfriend already for a month, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because we've been together the whole time, you know? So... But it was cute, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like guys are more traditional in Slovakia. Um, they are quite, quite handymen, you know. They know how to do things in the house, around the house. Here I happened to date a guy who wouldn't even know how to open a bottle of a beer if he didn't have an opener. And I was horrified because I'm like, dude, just like, punch it <laughs> on the table and open it you know and he's like oh i need an opener <laughs> like, this is not the guy <laughs> for the rest of my life he doesn't even know how to open a bottle of a beer um so yeah i i think they're they're more um more traditional for sure yeah i feel like in eastern and to a, to a sense in central europe there's more of an expectation that you're together to build something together, right? Like family values are really, really important. And uh, and when you date someone, you date because you want to be serious. But in the US, it's more about, yeah, we can date each other. We can see what else is out there. I'm not so sure we haven't had the talk yet to determine if we're actually exclusive or not. So you can date for a month or two months and not be exclusive until you have the conversation, which I think is super weird to most Europeans, but especially like, Central Eastern Europeans, because that's just not something we do. I'm Eastern European. And yeah, that's definitely not something we do back home. 
uh, even though I, you know, I left when I was really young, I still cannot relate to that because it just feels like very weird to me. If I'm dating someone, I'm genuinely invested in one person. And if that doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I want to give it my all because I don't have room in my heart for 10 men, you know, <laughs> also, I don't want to be making out, as you said, with all 10 men. Uh, <laughs> I want to be with one person. I don't even like that many people. <laughs> so if I like someone, I'm like, this is it <laughs> until it proves otherwise. And I think for me, that's a more romantic way to approach it. That's a more authentic way to approach dating because it's not shopping for me it's about I like you want to get to know you I'm not trying to see which one is better and then pick and choose and that I think is interesting because Americans obviously are renowned for the for that and Miami and New York but especially Miami is well renowned for that um so yeah you got I think you got very lucky um I'm Eastern European so I'll knock on wood for you um (laughs) that that you find your boyfriend and that he was respectful and genuine and actually wanted a relationship instead of just having fun. Yeah, 100 percent. Do you believe that Slovak women are typically very much into gender roles? Like, do you personally find it important that the man pays the bill and then helps you carry your heavy bags and opens the door or that you feel like he's your shoulder in times of need? Where if something's broken or today when things were malfunctioning, you can call him and say, baby, can you please help me out? I don't know what I'm doing. Is that important for you? It is important for me. And to this day, I'm still confused and I'm thinking about these things a lot lately. And I'm listening to a lot of podcasts about, you know, femininity and masculinity and gender roles and all that stuff. I feel like Slovakia you know, since it's in Central Europe, it has the influence of both sides. So it has the Eastern influence, Eastern Europe, which is very traditional. And the guy is the provider and the female is more in a household and, you know, mother. But we also have a lot of influence from Western world. Um, So I feel within myself, my whole life, this kind of a clash because the way I was raised was that obviously if I went on a date, my mom, she would ask me, did he at least pay for both of you? Right. So there was always this mindset. But at the same time, she would always keep telling me that I need to be educated. I need to have my job. I need to have my own money. I need to be independent. So the idea of the guy paying wasn't necessarily based on me being dependent on the guy and the guy being a provider. It was, it was more about being a gentleman and a treating a, go- a girl, treating a girl in a proper way so that he feels as a man and I feel as a woman. It was never based on me expecting a guy to you know, pay for my whole life. So I cannot speak for the whole Slovakia, (laughs) for the whole country. I can only speak for myself, uh, but I definitely appreciate when my boyfriend does things that I've seen my father and my brother do, which is obviously opening doors, carrying heavy bags, normal stuff if i have a heavy bag or a heavy luggage at the airport and the guy doesn't want to take it i i just give it to him because that's how i would do it with my father like i would give it to him just (laughs) he would take it without a question so it's normal to me i noticed that the guys here are not like paying attention to that that much my boyfriend does but he's different you know he's not from miami That's the detail we didn't mention. (laughs) He was born in Texas. He was uh, raised mostly in Colorado, but he also lived in Virginia, in England. He spent a lot of time in Australia. He was all over the place. So he's a blend of many cultures of the world. And I think that's what helps. (laughs) Um, But he's half Cuban as well. So he has a lot of influence of Miami too. So, but yeah, you know, he's opening doors. 
But when it comes to, for example, paying out, like when we go out, when we go eat, I I want him to pay, but not because I don't have money or because I want to use him for his money. I will rather have him pay and then, you know, I can either give him the money back when we're at home alone, with, not in public, or I can pay the utilities or I can pay groceries, I can pay other stuff, but I'm not going to take away this feeling of being a man from him when we're in public and when we're with friends that I'll be like, no, it's my turn. I'm paying. No, I I'm not going to do that. I know he enjoys feeling like a man and that he's paying. So I think we have this mutual understanding of these things. And I think that there is a big clash of understanding if people, for example, like coming from Eastern Europe, coming to, to, to the Western world, I see that uh, Western men are raised differently. The, here is more about here everything is more about equality you know we both work we both share our chores we both take care of children and i know that eastern mentality which is based on the past and the history is that you know men have been working women were not even allowed to work so they were just at home taking care of children in the household but that was like my great grandma but my grandma she was working. My mother was working. And I find it very um, unfair for my mother and for my grandmother that they had to work and then they had to come home and continue working with the whole household and taking care of children while men were only working. So. What I appreciate about my boyfriend is the fact that he knows we are both working, but he, I don't have to push him to do the household chores. I don't have to tell him to wash his dishes. I don't have to tell him to do his laundry. He surprises me. He's just like washing windows sometimes, you know, like I just come here and I see him washing windows. He doesn't expect me to do all these things, uh, which I love. You know, sometimes I tell my mom, uh, sometimes I go and I tell my mom, oh, I, I didn't cook anything today. And she's like, oh, and what did Eric say? Doesn't he, like, in her mind, she thinks that he would think less of me because I didn't take care of this. But in his mind, it's totally different. If we don't have food, he's just like, okay, let's order some or let me cook something. Let's go buy groceries. He doesn't see it that way. And it took me a long time to unlearn this habit that I learned from my mom to feel obligated to always make sure that we have clean house, to always make sure that we have food ready, that when... Because that's what she was telling me. If you want your man happy, you have to make sure that when he gets home from work, that he has food ready and warm and served and that we have beer in the fridge, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's obviously it's nice for the guy and it kind of makes sense, but I'm very happy that this is not my situation right now. Yeah. For the beer, I can't relate. I think that's just because you're a Slovak, but <laughs> <laughs> for all the other things I can totally relate because uh, when I lived with my ex, my mom would send me recipes and you should cook this for him because, you know, he's going to really appreciate you and he's never he's never going to want to be alone after you provide him with such comfort. and He's going to love coming home. And um, and I, I, I agree with that, but I also don't like the feeling of obligation because I think it's something that you should enjoy doing for each other. And same with my ex, like he didn't he didn't need me to do all these things. He he would be like, it's fine if we just eat sandwiches today. I was like, no, no, no. I have to make this you this big home cooked meal. I'm gonna make this stew for three hours. And um I was really high on that. And I think part of that was because it felt like I should be doing that, you know? I think our moms are quite similar that way, where my mom would always also say, Did he pay for you on the date? When I was younger, that was a huge priority for me to go on the date and someone pays the bill. And honestly, it still is, just because I think 
it's not about the money. It's about the gesture. And I want the man to be, I want him to be a bigger man in a way that he's not going to have 10, 20, $30 kind of ruin the interaction where he's going to say, oh, you owe me $12. Like that makes him seem petty to me. You know, it's more that because I don't (laughs) mind, you know, down the road, it doesn't matter when you live with each other. It doesn't matter as much, but it's that feeling of like, I can take care of you. And I think that's what's missing for a lot of women nowadays is that feeling of effort and feeling protected and feeling in admiration of someone where, you know, you're with a real man. He has integrity and he's not about paying for you to win you or, or anything like that. It's just that he had a nice time with you and he wants to show you that this money, it doesn't matter because I really like you. And I think for me, that's what's important. Um, Having said that, you know, independence, I think, has nothing to do with chivalry. And maybe the world we live in, we're confusing them and we're. And and it's a tough topic, right? Because um, a lot of women, they either expect this from men or on the opposite scale, they're like, don't do it because I'm an independent woman and you're going to offend me. So I can totally understand men's predicament. But like chivalry, no matter where you go in the world, it's it's appreciated. The only time I was surprised about the approach of a woman was when I had uh, an American roommate and she had totally different expectations from the guys than I did. And we had a lot of clash of opinions because she was dating guys from like, I don't know, some dating apps. And I was like, oh, is he at least going to pick you up? And she's like, oh my God, no, I don't even know him. (laughs) I wouldn't even get into a car with him. And I was just like, yeah, but it's a nice gesture if he picks you up. Why would you have to like get an Uber to get yourself to a restaurant? That to me, to me, sounded so like lame. (laughs) Like I, and I really like the fact that, for example, once I started dating an Italian guy, it was like a fresh breeze because suddenly you felt this European mentality and you didn't have to ask for things. He would like naturally offer to pick you up and open the car door. And so things like that. Or I even like had an argument with my roommate because she was convinced that she has to pay her half of the bill if it's the first date because they don't know if they like each other so she's not going to use him (laughs) and I didn't agree with her (laughs) now I watched the podcast with you and your boyfriend and I really loved uh, yes and I really loved what he had to say about you I mean dating you versus dating other Miami girls so because he's not here could you kind of reiterate and tell us what he finds are the differences Well, I think it's been quite a challenge for him. (laughs) Um, And I think mostly because of the communication. The way I talk. First of all, I'm limited by my uh, by the language. I'm limited because many times I cannot express myself exactly in a way I would in my own language. Uh, But also. You may know that American people, they express themselves in a way that's very, you know, sensitive. It's very thoughtful. Um, it's, they they're because <laughs> people here get offended very easily and that's the way they talk. They will not offend you, right? With me, it's different. Um, He always told me that I have this cold European heart (laughs) because I say things very blunt and very harsh. And I was, I was so frustrated so many times because I was just speaking my mind. I was speaking in exactly the same way as I would with my family or my ex-boyfriends and nobody would get hurt by the way I say things, but he got hurt, you know? 
And so I'm still struggling. I'm still learning. I'm still trying to assimilate to this American culture and the way they speak and the way they express their thoughts in a way that they will not offend anybody. Um, I don't know. We are just more rough <laughs> when we express ourselves. I think Europeans, Eastern Europeans, we just say it the way it is. And even if it's harsh, you know, two minutes later, we're fine. We're friends. We drink beer. But with my boyfriend, it's a little different story. If I say something a little more harsh, um, you know, I need to apologize. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, it's nice, you know, I'm learning these things because even in my family, when we were like not nice to each other, like we would just like, whatever, you know, we we move on. Um, so, yeah, it, sometimes it feels like you need to kind of walk on eggshells, but it's not exactly walking on eggshells. It's more just about thinking how to say things in a way that you will not hurt anybody. It's so interesting that you mentioned this one difference because I just posted a video on culture, cultural struggles that will, might cause some clashes in a relationship. And one of them was direct versus indirect communication. Um, I didn't put like uh, ch uh, the Czech Republic or Slovakia on the map, but I put Hungary as just like an example and Russia as an example. Uh, me being Russian, I'm very direct and I live in Canada, which is very polite. And a lot of times I can sense the um, lack of authenticity in people's communication where someone will say, I really love this on you or, oh, ah, and they're always smiling. And for me, it feels very unnatural because I am, I seem very like Americanized at this point or Canadianized, but at the bottom of my heart, I'm still very Eastern European with how I express myself. So for us, I think it's more... Uh, it's not because we want to be efficient or anything like that, but we don't want to be on the surface level. We want to get to the bottom of it. We really want to get up. We want to be real with someone. And the closer we are to someone, the more we want to be real with them. And that's actually more polite for us, because if you're really, really polite, then you're not a close person with this person. Right. Like with your close significant other, you can say what you think directly and you don't have to second guess yourself. And I think we just don't like fluff and we don't like any kind of fakeness in our communication. And we can really sense that. So that's why we go directly. But I can imagine someone being American. Uh, they, they're still fairly direct, but compared to our cultures, they are quite indirect. And so that's really funny that he that he has problems with this. <laughs> um, is there anything else in terms of uh, does he feel like it's is it all just difficult dating you? Are there any <laughs> positives? I mean, you guys are together. Um, or is there anything else that he struggles with as well? Um, I don't know. Maybe my temper, because I'm a very temperament person. Um, I can, I can uh, fire up quickly. <laughs> but I don't think that has anything to do with the culture it's more of a characteristic trait sure. uh, but I learned so much from him when it comes to communication and handling situation you know I feel like we are very Europeans we're in a fighting mode so when you feel certain like injustice you know you were not charged like you were overcharged or I don't know. I cannot find an example right now, but he is never in a fighting mode. You know, I'm always the one like, oh, let's contact them. Let's call them. Let's tell them. Let's let's do something about it. <laughs> and he's just like, he's so chilled about it. He's like, just let it go. Like, who cares? You know, and I would fight for everything because that's how I was raised, you know, to fight for myself, to stand up for myself especially when it comes to money like don't let anybody you know steal from you yada yada he has very different mentality he wouldn't fight over sense you know so to speak that's so funny i can relate so well with my ex-boyfriend he was always so chill about everything and i 
I get I'm very temperamental as well. And I get really riled up. And I think it's so easy to take advantage of someone, right? So um, he would, and in in arguments, the more he showed that he cared, the more I get irritated because I don't want to be the only one caring about something. But he would just be like, oh, it's whatever. It doesn't matter. Just whatever. Why are you so emotional about this? Just for, forget about it. And we always had this thing where I was like, how can you not be emotional about this? How can you not care about this? You know, and I don't know if it's like, is it a cultural thing? Or is it just a woman thing? I'm not really sure. It could just be a woman thing as well. <laughs> I think it has to do something with our culture and with our countries that, you know, especially in Slovakia, people work hard for their money. And they don't want to be, um, what's the word? They, taken advantage of? Taken advantage yeah, of. They, they, they don't want to be taken advantage of. And I feel like American people, since, you know, they're more comfortable, they have more money, they have different mindset when it comes to it. They just don't care that much about things. They will rather keep the peace than complain or... Uh, steer the steer the pot yeah great point i think we just had to i put you and i in the same box but essentially like that part of the world i think we just had to survive more or we'd learn from our parents and grandparents how to uh take advantage of situations so that you can gain something more out of it or um, go around it or cheat the system or but you had to always kind of navigate your way through that. Whereas I think North Americans in general, they're just solely back. And maybe even sometimes I feel like Western Europeans who've never had to fight for anything that have always had it easy because my ex-boyfriend was Western European and he'd never even considered like he was fine with losing money and just whatever. He didn't care. And for me, it's like maybe that for me, it was the post-Soviet um, mindset of like saving money and not wasting it on stupid things. And why would I go and eat a salad next to my place at a restaurant where I can make that salad at home? Like these kind of silly things that are built into you from your parents or uh, from your family. And I find that really interesting. I've never actually thought about that until you brought it up. But I think it's it's it is interesting because Americans have never had to um, survive. They've never had to navigate their way around. They just kind of are chill in that way, which, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, I think it's this um, this mentality of being comfortable. It's not always for their highest good because I feel like they might lack ambition because they never had to really fight for, you know, not even survival, but just, you know, trying to save money and being in a... If you're raised in the U.S., You've never been to a third world country or even in developing country. You you don't understand. Your mindset is very limited to where you grew up mm -hmm. and you're being comfortable. And that's why you're not even fighting for your rights or what, you know, not to be taken advantage of. Yeah. How has living in the U.S. changed you? I would say it made me more independent, uh, also financially independent. Um, it changed me in a way that I am open to new challenges. I am more brave. I am more courageous. I just feel like the fact that I moved here, I achieved the dream that I didn't even ever think that will come true <laughs> is something that gives me the strength and power to reach for more and to, you know, start a podcast and accept challenges, accept jobs. And uh, just, I feel like I've already been through so much and oh, so much struggles and and stress and and suffering and i've got where i've got that nothing is impossible anymore for me uh, i think it gives me a lot of power 
And at the same time, I feel like it changed me in a way that I'm thinking and I'm communicating and I see the difference on me, especially when I go back to Europe and I communicate with people and I see how grumpy they are and how rude they are (laughs) and um, not that friendly as here. And honestly, when I moved here, it literally bothered me how friendly everybody was. As funny as it may sound, but as funny as it may sound, but everybody was so friendly and smiling and hello, how can I help you? And I'm just like, leave me alone. <laughs> People telling, saying hi to me on the streets. And I would be like, what do you want from me? Like, this is weird. Don't say hi. People talking to you on at the bus stop and in the store. And now I am like that when I go. <laughs> When I go back to Europe and I'm like one weirdo there <laughs> being friendly and talking to everybody because everyone is so cold, you know, they have their poker face. No, but you don't say hello to a person you don't know in person, right? Here, everybody says, hi, and how are you? And the funniest part was that I started answering to how are you, how I actually am. But in reality, no one is really interested how you are. <laughs> it's just a phrase, you know. <laughs> They don't really go into deep when it comes to conversations, um, which is something that kind of bothers me a little bit here. I don't have, I don't actually have American girlfriends here. Most of my friends are from Europe or from other parts of the world. Um, And I think it's based on the fact that the conversations don't go into a depth. They're always Mm -hmm. in this like um, shallow level on the surface if they ask you like hey how is the podcast going for example right and I genuinely want to start talking about it you know like what guests I'm inviting and uh, how hard it was to start and blah 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 but they're not even listening um so that's the difference with with European girlfriends that they're genuinely interesting and they're asking in-depth questions and This is what I think that um, makes us interesting for maybe American, us girls, interesting for American guys or Miami guys. If we are able to go in depth, if we are able to speak honestly and being ourselves and make them feel that they can be themselves around us, which is not very, very common here. Um, so yeah, but to get yeah. back to your question, how it changed me, um, I feel like my communication level is, but I'm more friendly. I'm more friendly to strangers, I would say. Yeah. That's, that's the one thing. Yeah. But I'm still missing the, the in-depth conversations with people for sure. I think you nailed that. I mean, there is no right or wrong answer here, but you have really described those cultural differences super well and everything that I like and don't like about um, North American culture. I want to say North American because obviously it can vary within um, even the U.S., obviously. But still, uh, there is a bit more superficiality. But on the same side, you have easier access to new people and you can meet people easier. Whereas in, yeah, in the Czech Republic or Slovakia or Hungary, people do come off incredibly grumpy. Customer service is, I have <laughs> no words. I really don't even have words for it. it. It's all about if they've had their coffee, if they're happy about their day, are they happy or are they not? Like there's no set <laughs> guarantee that you can expect from this, uh, from the customer service. So uh, uh, it leaves a lot to be desired, whereas in the U.S. you can count on it being great, of course, because you have to then pay a tip on top of the service. Um, but I think it's interesting how moving abroad can make you more friendly. And then you don't even realize how grumpy people were before you left. And then you go back and you're like, oh, I was one of those people. I was just as miserable. Like, But now you see it with fresh eyes that you become more Americanized and then they look at you like you're a foreigner in the in your own country. So thank you so much for breaking that down. And thank you so much for um, taking part in this podcast. 
I would have loved to keep it on, you know, going longer. But for the record, we had quite a lot of technical glitches today. So we've already been here for a couple of hours. Uh, Tatiana, what a great conversation. Thank you so, so much. I really love this. I think it was such a genuine look at both cultures, which I always appreciate on a podcast. And that's why it's always nice to have someone from Slovakia take part because I, I can trust you to say how it is. Um, so yeah, where can go and people, where can people go and check you out? Well, thank you so much, Marina, first of all, for inviting me on your podcast. It was a real surprise and also um, a pleasure. Uh, how can people find me? So my name is Tatiana Robova. That's also my Instagram handle, Tatiana underscore Robova. And uh, I also have a podcast called Landing America. So that's how they can find it on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. I'm basically everywhere by now. And it's called Landing America Podcast. Well, thank you for coming on. And guys, any thoughts that you have on this podcast, whether you're watching it on YouTube or listening to it on Spotify or Apple, please let us know what you thought about this episode. And if you have any questions for Tatiana and yeah, go check out our podcast because she has a lot of really great videos on the topic of moving to the US and on these cultural differences and more getting visas and all the kind of legal stuff that you have to worry about if you're considering moving to the US from Europe. Um, thank you, Tatiana. And guys, stay tuned for next week's podcast where I feature another country. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.